I had called some people I knew back on the East Coast. Now, I'm out here in California, right? Mm -hmm. Back in New York, because I had heard some rumors through the grapevine about some very strange, unsettling things happening at the morgue. And incidentally, Long Island and the New York City morgue, I had called up some contacts I had there and I asked about that. And then I was put on to an astounding figure of missing children. Now, this was all in connection with the overall mutilation question with humans. Welcome back. I'm here with Don Ecker. Don, welcome. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. So you've been in this or covering this topic for an extremely long period of time in terms of running UFO magazine for over two decades. And there's a deep dive that you did on a story in the mid nineties where there was a UFO flap along the eastern seaboard, predominantly in the northeast. And this story kind of gets pretty intricate, involves Brookhaven National Laboratory, Long Island UFO encounters, a strange individual with the last name of Ford. Hmm. And it's pretty tangled. So I think I brought you on to at least attempt to untangle it. So how did all this start? Well, number one, Sean, look, when my wife, who was the founder of UFO Magazine in 1986, when I came on board was 1988, and because of my background with the military and as a police criminal investigator, I became the director of research. I was injured in the line of duty in 1986. And subsequently, I medically retired. And I was kind of kicking around. I got to tell you, I always had a very strong interest in this inexplicable phenomena. In 1966, okay, while I was in high school, I'm from Pennsylvania, Central Western. 
And in that part of the country, especially, all right, November, December are very, very big times because of the hunting season, primarily the deer season. I was a deer hunter. And in December of 1966, I was with three other friends. We were in an area known as the Horseshoe Curve, Mm -hmm. which was actually a mid-19th century engineering, basically a miracle, because they built this horseshoe-shaped railroad track, which actually could take trains from the East Coast out west towards Chicago and other places. And as a side note, in World War II, you know, had the German Luftwaffe been capable of reaching North America, all right, that was reportedly on their 10 top most wanted areas to be bombed because of all the military freight that traveled to and fro. But I digress. So in 66, it was probably the first or second day of the deer season. It was late in the afternoon, about ah, 4, 4, 15 p.m., getting very dark at that time of year. And we were coming down off the mountain going home when suddenly one of my friends who was behind me started yelling and jumping around. And my first thought was, oh, this moron saw a deer. Okay, he's going to scare it off. And I turned around, and he was looking up in the sky. His mouth was hanging open, and we were being overflown by four brilliant lights in a diamond formation. Okay, that's all I could see was the light. And they weren't going that fast. But about the time they were past me, and I was in front, Okay, suddenly the light in the rear shot straight up into the sky. And I'm talking like a missile blasting off, just straight up. And it was gone. And suddenly now these three lights in a V formation, it was like somebody walked up behind them and kicked them in the rear. They blasted out of sight in seconds. Now, prior to that, I wouldn't think they were even traveling 150, maybe 200 miles an hour. But within seconds, they were totally gone. I got to tell you, that blew our collective minds. So I've always had an interest in that. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. Don, just to quickly add to that, so I'm pulling this from another interview. Are you familiar with who Angela Ford is, the remote viewer, Project Stargate? Or she went by a different name back then. That's her married name. No, no. I her no. I knew many of the remote viewers after the fact, of course, when the story broke. I was personal friends with Ingo Swan, the man that designed the protocols for the Stargate program. People like Joe McGonigal and and many others, Paul mm-hmm. Smith. Okay. I've interviewed them, we've talked, some I've interviewed on the radio, but I'm not familiar with her, no. So she grew up, not necessarily in Altoona, but I think a little bit eastward, but in Pennsylvania, in around the same time period that you reported that, she also had a sighting when she was growing up in the same area. So just to put that aside, when I notice these sorts of commonalities, I like to just 
put a pin in it so that people can see it. But next time I talk to her, I'll ask her to recount it. But there's also a video that I've already recorded that folks can check out because I also mapped it out where she saw it. So anyway. I, I, as an aside, I would be very curious where the physical location was. I have it. I just don't have it up here right now. But after the interview, I can certainly send you a link. Well, hey, look, that area in Pennsylvania was rife with sightings. As a matter of fact, when I came back from the Army in 1972, okay, I saw an ad for a new book that was going to be released by an author that I was aware of at the time. Silent Invasion by Stan Gordon. No. No? Okay. Well, no. there's another one to check out. <laughs> no. John Keel. Oh, yeah. Mothman Prophecies. Okay. Later, I got to know Keel. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Keel was one of the people I interviewed when I got involved in some mutilation research. I had been involved, I was actually the lead investigator on two cattle mutilations that happened 1981-82. This, incidentally, was not in Pennsylvania. But later, because of a series of events that happened, I had been exposed by a friend of mine to a case that seemed to suggest there had been human mutilations very yeah. similar, okay, to the cattle mutilations. In 1989, I began an investigation that lasted for over three years researching that. One of the first people that I talked to, incidentally, was John Keel because of Keel's theory involving the MIB and other cryptid creatures that he talked about in the Mothman prophecies. That's another topic altogether. I mean, we could really go down a rabbit hole. Yeah, the that. whole human mutilation thing, it's like... Well, that's what I was originally known for, was my research in human mutilations. We have to do... I mean, obviously not today. We have to do an entire episode on that because that's the one place in this field that people don't touch. It's really weird. There's like a taboo against it, but there are cases. And oh, I, I was, I was, I was attacked vociferously when we started running some articles in UFO magazine about that. To advertise on Through Glass Darkly, email Through Glass Darkly ads at gmail.com. I had <laughs> I had done some research. I had called some people I knew back on the East Coast. Now I'm out here in California, right? Mm -hmm. Back in New York, because I had heard some rumors through the grapevine about some very strange, unsettling things happening at the Morgan, incidentally, Long Island and the New York City morgue. I had called up some contacts I had there, and I asked about that. And then I was put on to an astounding figure of missing children. Now, this was all in connection with the overall mutilation question with humans. So my wife and I were at this UFO conference right after that magazine came out. And if I recall, it was July of 93. And we're walking down the hall outside of some of these conference rooms where they had speakers. And suddenly, and the reason I mentioned this is because I saw this guy had been one of your guests. Whitley Streber came blowing out of that room, saw my wife and I, and his now deceased, but at the time, his former wife, who later, unfortunately, passed on. But they saw my wife and I, and they jumped in front of us, screaming like mad people, because at that time, Streber 
was still on the friendly ET. They're here for our benefit business. Okay, he's starting to he's starting to slowly turn. If you want, like, he's kind of unsure right now. Uh huh. I'm sure that he's unsure about a lot of things. Okay. So at any rate, but to get back to this, yeah. So we had garnered quite a bit of hate among the love light unicorns and pixie fart UFO crowd. All right. They didn't like that. But just like a cop, okay, which I was, you got to tell it as you find it. You lay it out. Yeah, and you can't you ignore may the not data. Like it. Okay. Right. You may not like it, but this is what I discovered. And there we go. All right. Well, since we're talking about Long Island and the Eastern Seaboard, I'm happy to take the macabre out. Let's start with the human mutilations in Long Island and then kind of weave it from there if that works. <laughs> well, one of the cases that I came up with, okay, through my contacts. Now, I was told. I better not mention his name. Yeah, I was I told by an individual, okay, that I knew, all right, that the government had been shipping cattle into New York because they were having so many animals that were being discovered mutilated, okay, to make up this discrepancy, the mutilated animals. Now, Look, I was not there. I did not witness this, but I was assured this was the truth. So in terms of your contacts, without saying a name, like what kind of contacts were they? Were they police, law enforcement, military intelligence? Yes, what? yes. All of the above. All of the okay. above. Now, this became a little more prob problematic. You mentioned a guy there by the name of Ford. His name was John Ford. Okay. John Ford at the time was a court law court. Okay. Legal court, an officer of the court. Now, I never met him, but I had numerous telephone conversations with John Ford. Now, the guy was brusque, was touchy, was basically hard to get along with, extremely opinionated. Later, he was to be arrested by law authorities there, law enforcement authorities, he was accused of putting radioactive material in a tube of toothpaste that he had one of his, shall we say, people he didn't get along with. He was going to try to plant this toothpaste on this guy. This was the accusation. Well, he ended up being arrested, and then he was placed for observation in a mental institution. Now, there was a woman in the UFO field, a woman that my wife and I knew very well, by the name of Elaine Douglas, okay, who had been one of the leading lights at that time in the mutual UFO network, MUFON. All right. And she was living at the time in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. Now, MOFON, okay, we all know that that's one of the today, the longest civilian UFO investigative civilian group around. It came after APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. There's a lot of mud there, too between MUFON and APRO. But MUFON, certainly in recent years, has had its share of problems. But Elaine became convinced that Ford was set up, okay, wrongly convicted, wrongly placed in a mental institution, 
because of what he was trying to expose that happened at the national labs there, which involved, by the way, UFOs, UFO overflights, purportedly either a crash or a shoot down, mm -hmm. a shoot down of a UFO. And by the way, I did some research after you and I spoke yesterday. You were correct. It was flight 800. Okay. The aircraft that got knocked down. Flight 800. I was wrong. I thought it was 400. I don't, I will, I will split the difference, Sean. Okay. Uh, nobody even needs to know this, Don. This is, this is all private conversation. You were right all along. You said 800. I said 400. Well, <laughs> I didn't lie on my own show, but look, we're just trying to get the data right. And this, for folks who watch the channel, there's a whole episode with David Morehouse dissecting what happened to TWA Flight 800 and its relationship to Brookhaven National Lab. But go on, Don. I didn't want to steal your thoughts. Well, you see, in the aftermath of all of this was the loss of this aircraft. Now, there was a tremendous controversy at the time that this aircraft had mistakenly or inadvertently been shot down by a missile, okay, launched according to who you listen to, mm. because like I said, there were a lot of chefs in that kitchen, okay, whether it was because, as some told me, well, they saw something, they had to get rid of that airplane, and then others said, no, it was mistaken for a UFO, you know, there was some kind of script. I mean, nobody knew what the hell was going on, and nobody even could agree that it was shot down until right. some material was recovered, including a, a passenger seat that seemed to have residue on it from a rocket. Okay, you're familiar with that, right? Right. So this was a crazy thing. But Ford had been initially in the middle of all of this. Now, he called me up numerous times originally to try to convince me, okay, to get UFO magazine convinced that there had been either a crash or a shoot down of an unidentified flying object there at the National Lab. So... I got to tell you, I was a little hanky dealing with John because, quite honestly, at the time, I never knew when he would go off on a tangent or we could just have a regular conversation, if you know what I mean, Sean. Yeah, he sounds bipolar, actually. Yeah. I actually, I think you're on to something there with that. I really do. Yeah. But, you know, as a former police officer, this idea of putting radioactive material, I would love to see the case files on that, okay? Which isn't, I never will, but... Isn't that, isn't that what they accused Phil Schneider of doing as well? Giving people radioactive rocks at conferences and stuff? You know, Phil Schneider at Dulce? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Anyway, I don't want to go down that line, but... It seems like it might be a technique. It's possible. Hey, look, when I originally started at UFO Magazine, and, you know, I got to tell you, I had never really thought about it, but my wife told me at the get-go, I believe that the UFO research field has always been a training ground and a playground for people with military intelligence. And mm -hmm. I think she's absolutely right. The amount of disinformation, misinformation, cases like the Paul Benowitz case. Yep. Okay. Yep. Now, I knew Paul Benowitz, not well, but I knew him. And I was at the conference when former very prominent UFO researcher, William Moore, admitted before an audience of hundreds and hundreds of people that he had worked 
hand in glove with passing, knowingly passing disinformation from his military intelligence sources to civilian scientist Paul Benowitz to the point where Benowitz was driven into a psychiatric institution, okay? We were there when this was happening. And I've often wondered with things recently, like the UFO UAP hearings from last July, Mm -hmm. why things like this were never discussed or even brought up. That's one thing about this field that basically I'm known for with my historical retrospective on this field. Because before I even became involved, I did an extremely deep dive into the history of this field, going back, well, actually before 47. But the things that I have uncovered over the years, and it's enough to turn anybody's head around if they are willing with an open mind to examine the data. And once you do, you know, there's no doubt whatsoever that this phenomena is real. It's been with us an exceedingly long time. Mm-hmm. And the bottom line is we have been the meat puppets on a string as far as this is concerned. Today also, with everything else, we're puppets. But this is beyond any doubt in my mind. Okay, so you met with Ford or you started to... Never physically. But started talking to him to try mm-hmm. to figure out what the heck's going on with this nexus between Brookhaven National Lab, allegations of a crashed or down craft, and this weird turn eventually, but when you were talking to him, it hadn't happened yet. Well, I got to was- tell you, if we, if we would have had the wherewithal, money-wise, I would have been on the first airplane I could get on and go back there physically myself to sit down, go in there and do some deep diving, some snooping and pooping around there. But we didn't have it. So all I could do from the standpoint I was at at the time was to talk to him and a few others. And it certainly sounded as if something, in fact, had been going on there. But, Sean, it was so amorphous in many ways, okay? It was very amorphous. And when you're dealing with a witness, okay, and you're not sure, me, okay, was not sure of the stability of this primary guy I've been talking to, That put a patina of doubt over a lot of stuff at the time for me. And I'm just being very honest about that. Did you talk to anybody else outside of Ford in terms of trying to figure out? Oh, yes. What did you you learn about this nexus of of events? Like, what rabbit hole or holes did it lead you down? (laughs) Well, (laughs) a loaded question. yeah, Yeah, really, it is. My God, there were a lot of rabbit holes. One rabbit hole purportedly involved, this is going to sound crazy, but one or two missing corpses from the morgue. Individuals that had been brought into the morgue Okay, dead, obviously. And then what's next? Okay, well, from the standpoint of a cop, okay, the circumstances surrounding where the victim was found, okay, any evidence that may be prevalent, okay, it's got to be picked up, it's got to be cataloged, got to be identified. The body then is taken to the morgue. The medical examiner has to come in, conduct an autopsy, run a chemical screen on the fluids in the body, you know, 
remove the organs, make sure there's nothing abnormal about the organs, that type of thing. And the bodies went missing. Now, <laughs> it sounds like the bad opening detective. scene How often of, does of that a vampire happen? movie, you know? Yeah, you're a detective. How often does that happen? Not very often. Not I didn't very think often. so. But. <laughs> not very often at all. And I reported on this. Now, when I reported on this, this also was involved with missing children. Okay. Young peoples under the age of 18. All right, for the most part. Now, every year, okay, if you check the FBI database, mm -hmm. you check local law enforcement, you know, agencies, missing children, kids go missing for any number of reasons. And often, many of them will turn back up. Kids that are running away from a bad home environment, a bad home situation. Kids that get tangled up with drugs, narcotics. Kids that, for whatever reason, leave home, run away from home, get tied up in the sexual industry, the sex industry. Boys, girls, doesn't matter. And many of these people ultimately will come to the notice of law enforcement. And unfortunately, because of circumstances, a lot of those kids may end up dead. But most of them, we know what happened to them. Well, let me tell you what. There are thousands and thousands that we have no clue what happened to them. Now, you can make of that what you will. Are there serial murderers out there? You better believe it, okay? At any one time, the FBI has theorized, and I forget now the exact figure, of suspected serial killers that may be roaming the nation, okay? Maybe 25, 35 at any one time. Now, some of these people ended up with some huge death scores. I wrote a paper dealing with my hypotheses on human mutilation. This was like 87, 88 when I wrote this paper. Now, this was immediately following my medical retirement from my department. And I was curious because I no longer had access to the National Information Crime Computers back in Washington, D.C. So I was trying to find out because I had uncovered one case in the state of Idaho that suggested this male adult had been mutilated, very similar to cattle. So, I no longer could call up the FBI or anybody else as, as a law mm -hmm. enforcement officer. So, I, I went to two friends of mine that were both law enforcement. One was a detective with the Boise, Idaho Police Department. The other was a deputy sheriff with one of the local county sheriff's departments. And I gave them a criteria. I said, do me a favor. Run this, if you would, all right, through the National Crime Computer back in D.C. And this is the criteria I want you to check for. Number one, any unnamed or unknown apparent homicides of anybody in the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Nevada. Okay. Now, incidentally, all those states have been hotbeds for UFO sightings. 
Number two, I want to find out, and I'm talking about only the ones that have not been solved, how many of those people have been accounted for, okay? And one or two other things. Well, my buddy at the Boise PD said, Don, he said, okay, he said, I I can run this. He said, but I got to warn you, it's probably going to take a week or more for any results to get back. And I said, okay, that's no problem. So three days later, I get a call from my friend. And he said, hey, man, are you trying to get me fired? I knew that was was coming. (laughs) And I said, fired? uh, Hell no. What are you talking about? He said, well, after I made that inquiry, he said, I get called into my lieutenant's office. And he immediately starts chewing my butt off. He said, my God, what the hell have you got me into? Now, my buddy in the sheriff's department was not quite that dramatic, but he got shut down. Now, this is the weird part. So after I know that none of this, okay, is clicking anywhere upstairs, Oh, Mm -hmm. I'm raising red flags, okay, but there's no data coming about. When he got his butt chewed, what did he get his butt chewed for? Like, did they get a call or, like? Well, actually, they could blame him for anything. Why are you making this inquiry? Are you working Mm -hmm. a current case that this has anything to do with you? See what I'm saying? Wasting resources, basically, is what they were. Okay, yeah, sure. I got it. So, one day... Now, this is about three weeks later, okay? I had written a preliminary paper about my research into human mutilations, and it had gone out on the nascent web. All right? Now, at that time... All right, we're talking in the 80s. All right, the internet was nothing at all like it is today. Nothing, not even close. But what had picked up the slack, okay, as far as computer users were concerned, were the bulletin board systems, BBS, okay? Now, I was a part of something called the Paranet bulletin board system now this was the nascent petri dish literally the petri dish where all the ufo and other paranormal topics first emanated from as far as computers were concerned now Mm -hmm. up to that point all right most computer bbs's and things like that were concerned with things like writing code, architecture of computers, or anything to do with computers. Well, there was a guy by the name of James Spicer, Jim Spicer, down in Fountain Hills, Arizona, who had a different idea. He had gotten into the computer thing and created this BBS system, Paranet, all right, This is in 86, and he thought, well, you know, there are a lot of cases now coming forward talking about UFO situations, the Bentwaters case, Mm -hmm. the Japan airliner that encountered a stupendously huge UFO, Gulf Breeze, the Gulf Breeze UFO situation was starting to percolate. Bud Hopkins was doing his abduction research then. So, Spicer geared Paranet toward that. Now, how I met him was after I bought my first private computer system, and I had a modem, we were still groping in the dark. I discovered CompuServe. 
Mm-hmm. Now, CompuServe was a pay service, all right? And there was a forum in there called the Issues Forum. And in 1981-82, I had been, as I mentioned, lead investigator on two cattle mutilations. And I came across some articles on cattle mutes, which intrigued me to no end. So I became kind of an active participant, and I met Jim, all right? So I kind of got a heads up on what was happening out there. So I had written this preliminary report. One of the places I put it was on Spicer's Paranet Alpha, okay? By this time, Paranet had spread out around the country and into Europe. There were paranet nodes, literally. So we actually were going around the globe. They had paranet nodes in Australia, in Japan, in Germany, France, Great Britain, etc. So one afternoon, I'm at home. By the way, I was taking some computer course work at the Boise State University. And my phone rang. And I answered it. I really, I wasn't expecting anybody. And this guy started talking to me, identified himself. He said, my name is this. He said, by the way, he said, Don, he said, I work for the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency. And I said, oh, okay, well, <laughs> what can I do for you? He right, said, it's not well, like you're using drugs, right? Yeah. He said, I read your paper. Be a little more specific. Well, about human mutilations. Okay. And he said, well, I got to tell you. He said, at first, I thought you were out of your freaking mind. Well, that's not unexpected. (laughs) That's not unexpected. He said, so I did a little diving on it. And he said, the reason I'm calling you is to tell you, he said, I'd watch my six. And I said, oh, really? He said, man, he said, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. But if I were you, this is not a good road to go down. Oh, okay. Well, that didn't stop me. Okay. Yeah. Well, Actually, did you ask him why? <laughs> like, why? Well, of course. He said. <laughs> There are people, there are people that don't want this out. Which people? (laughs) Well, I mean, that's about as crystal clear as it got, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't know this guy. Hey, Sean, this guy could have been my mother's great-great-uncle, okay? I wouldn't have known the difference. He said he was DEA. Maybe he was. Maybe he was a provocateur. Who knows? Okay? Could have been anybody. So I said, okay, well, I got my little friend here. So yeah, I'm doing all right. So there you go. But I said it was weird. And mm-hmm. it was weird. Okay, so you're digging for some of these reports, trying to find information on human mutilations. There's a case in Long Island where the two bodies that just went missing. When you were digging at that thread, did that take you anywhere? Ultimately, no. Now, I did say earlier that John Keel, you know who Keel was, of course. Okay. I got Operation Trojan Horse right in front of me. Yeah, among other things. Okay. The Mothman Prophecies. Okay. Probably his most famous. But Mm -hmm. I called John up. And this is in the initial stages of my investigation. And I told him what apparently I and another guy had located that had happened in the state of Idaho. And I said, John, is this new to you? Are you familiar with this? He said, oh, yeah. He said, sure. He said, actually, he said, I'm aware of a case that happened very near 
the Mexico and Texas border. And I said, oh, really? Well, what was that about? He said, well, he said a guy and his wife had driven down into Mexico. They were on vacation. Now, this is probably over 50 years ago, Sean, okay? But now, from today, but maybe even 55 years ago. He said, but as they were coming back, very close to the border, but they hadn't reached the border yet, coming back into the U.S., they're driving down the highway, and suddenly, out of a literally a clear blue sky, a body that had been severed in two dropped from the sky onto the highway. And I went, oh, Jesus, John, are you kidding? He said, nope. He said, that happened. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, they pulled over. Of course, I forget how they got in touch with the local authorities, but they did. And they looked up. They didn't see anything in the sky. They didn't see an aircraft or anything else. This thing just dropped literally out of the blue. Now, I got to tell you, I, I never quite knew what to make of that. All right. Did I think that Keel was working from his best knowledge base about this? He seemed positive that the case was real. But then there had been several other cases that came to my attention, particularly out of South America. Now, yeah, that's where most of them are, I think. Right. At least the cases that you hear about. Jacques Vallée, okay, very well-known computer expert guru. I mean, that's what Vallée originally was one of the first to start cataloging, computerizing UFO cases going back to the 60s. He was a close confidant with J. Allen Hynek the civilian astronomer that had been attached to Project Blue Book and other things, had been made aware of what seemed to be a preponderance of cases taking place in South America, Chile, Peru, Venezuela, where unidentified flying objects were operating in a very hostile manner, okay? Literally attacking human beings, usually in isolated areas, okay? But Valet was very positive in what he was writing. Now, Valet was also the very same guy that wrote a number of books about the phenomena, but one was called Passport to Magonia. Are you familiar with uh, that book, Sean? Also in front of me. Okay. All right. It's right beneath. I have Operation Trojan Horse, The Day After Roswell by Corso, and then right underneath Corso is Passport to Magonia. Okay. Now, this book, Passport to Magonia, I would recommend, now this is just me, okay, but if you've never read it, get a copy of the book. Get yourself a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. Get some cheese, some French bread, a little garlic butter, and sit down and start pouring and then start reading. This book will blow your mind. Now, Valet, in many aspects, you know, is ahead of his time. Although, I got to be very honest, I pissed off Valet. Of course, Valet is French, okay? The French are notoriously easy to piss off. I pissed him off because I did a book review on one of his books for UFO Magazine. And while I gave him a glowing review, and hey, I'm, I'm not one of those people that'll kiss your ass 
okay, and give you a glowing review if I didn't think it was glowing. But I mentioned in passing in this book, because at the time, at the time, Roswell was still at the tip of everybody's tongue. I said he didn't mention Roswell. Well, when he read that review, Sean, he wrote us a page and a half article explaining himself and demanded that we print it in the next issue of UFO magazine. And hey, <laughs> touchy, touchy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 It's almost. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like, are you sure, buddy? It's going to make you look even worse for the <laughs> fact that you felt the need to write this. Just let it go. Yeah. But did you publish it? I would have published it. Oh, yes. Right. Oh, my God, yes. We published it. <laughs> Hell, yes. Oh, yeah. My wife, the sun rose and set with the lady. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's the way it was. Okay, so anyway, that was the deal with that. But South America has notoriously been one of those areas where a lot of hostility and even human deaths have occurred, apparently, as a result of interaction with UFOs. So, I don't know. I don't know. Now, I recently wrote a paper on the disclosure movement that really picked up steam circa December 2017. And this was on the heels of now deceased, but former Senator Harry Reid, senior senator from Nevada, who gave a press conference, okay, and announcing that he and several other senators had acquired a sum of money around $22 million to finance a new department at the Pentagon researching items of unknown origin or aerial phenomena. Hey, well, I mean, you can wrap it up any way you want to, it comes out UFOs. But in the meantime, somebody at the DOD or somewhere decided they didn't like UFO anymore. It sounded too tinfoil hatty, so they changed the acronym to UAP. Well, a rose is a rose is a rose, all right? And the bottom line was, Reed said that the Pentagon, contrary to all the decades of denial, are still researching UFOs. Well, mm -hmm. then suddenly, all right, out of the woodwork comes people like Christopher Mellon, a former Undersecretary of State for Intelligence. Intelligence, right. And Lou Elizondo, the guy that claimed, and by the way, Lou has been ghosting me. I have tried on three or four occasions to get him to come on my radio program. And in 1992, I embarrassed the Pentagon very, very badly. Okay. It was as a result of a shuttle mission, STS-48. All right. And it's apparent encounter with a bogey, okay, above Australia and New Zealand, and what appeared to be a weapons shooting at this bogey. I did it on CNN while I was debating Jim Oberg from NASA, a NASA contract scientist. Now, Oberg, see, a lot of people didn't know that Oberg had been a nuclear officer in the Air Force. All right. I did my homework. Yeah. So he knows they're real. They probably appeared when he was working at a missile silo, right? Well, he accused me of coming on Larry King Live to sell magazines. He said, Well, hell yes, I'm here to sell magazines. You yeah, can bet. I do both? Can I do both? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this was a reason why I think Elizondo was warned off me, not only him, 
But Travis Taylor, another guy, okay, who through people I know and what have you, I've been in touch with these guys. A buddy of mine, all right, who knows Taylor, had contacted Taylor, and Taylor said, oh, yeah, sure, have him call me. So I got his phone number. I got his email address. I called, left a message, wrote, told him to get back to me, called again, left him. He avoided me. Well, then we find out, okay, that Travis Taylor is a scientific advisor on one of these UAP programs. All right? Nobody knew that. All right? Nobody knew that. The people at Skinwalker Ranch where he's out there prostituting himself once a week. Okay, nobody knew that there. Well, and, you can uh, tell because they keep doing episodes about this 1.6 gigahertz signal. Like, what could it possibly be? Who knows <laughs> what it is? And it's just like, you know, Delta for like the Delta operatives use Iridium cell phones and the frequency, it's like there's two bands. It's 1.61 something gigahertz and then 1.61 something else gigahertz. Right. So it's a military communications channel. Right. So he knew damn well what 1.6 gigahertz was. Anyway, that's an entirely different tangent. Yeah, you see how this works. Yeah. Okay. You see how this works. Look, you and I both, although different times, we've been down that road. Okay. I was down that road in Southeast Asia. <laughs> I was down that road as a criminal investigator. I worked... Two years undercover on narcotics, okay? By the way, I went in as a biker. You should have seen me in my outfit. Oh, my God, I was scary. I scared myself. So, no, really. So, this is back in the early 80s. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, I know how this stuff works. Most people, okay, unfortunately, are apt to believe what they first hear. Now, the Pentagon just put out the Arrow Report, okay, just not very long ago, stating that, hey, you can just move along. There's nothing to nothing see Nothing to see here. Move nothing along. These are not the all. droids you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. 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 Forget all those people that went to Congress, these so-called whistleblowers. Hey, they're hoaxing or lying. Well, did you see there? There were there were aspects of obvious internal sabotage in that thing, mm -hmm. right? Like they got Senator Reid's date wrong. They got a date wrong on the guy who coined the name Flying Saucer. That whole account they got the day wrong, just off by one day. And there's a few other things that I think they got wrong, but they were very subtle yet obvious mistakes. So my read on that is there's somebody on that arrow team who wanted to discredit the report. Sean Kirkpatrick, maybe. Oh my God. Could it be him? That I don't do you think? Oh, I, I doubt it, know. but I doubt it, but it's possible, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, look, I do a show on Thursday evenings on KGRA DB with three other co-hosts. It's called UAP Crossfire. It's a show reminiscent of the political programs back in the 80s, the Crossfire with, oh God, I can't even think. Pat that. Buchanan was on it. Was it? Wasn't Tucker Carlson on it way back when? I don't remember him. Buchanan, yeah. actually, the first... Larry King show I ever did was in October of 89, okay? And it was concerning the purported landing of a UFO in the Soviet Union city of Voronezh. This yeah. was prior to the Iron Curtain falling, okay? Buchanan was the host that night. Larry King was on his third, fourth, Maybe it was his fifth honeymoon, okay? He had a habit of getting married and divorced and married and divorced. Anyway, he was off, and it was Buchanan that did that. And I practically, actually, 
I gave Pat Buchanan close to a heart attack at the end of that program. They had a guy by the name of, I think it was Peter Adams, who was some type of defense magazine reporter. Now, the one thing about Larry King, whenever they had a topic of UFOs, they always had to have the skeptic in there, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you would have the pro-UFO guy and the skeptic. Now, the thing that made me a little different than most UFO, pro-UFO people that will go in there, I wasn't afraid to tangle, okay? And as a matter of fact, to this day, Jim Ober has never truly forgiven me, okay, for that STS-48 show, which incidentally, you can see that on youtube okay oh i'm already i'm already on it i'm already looking for it okay because <laughs> if i find it i'm definitely playing it in this episode for sure okay so anyway this guy okay at the end of the show all right and i'm laying all my stuff out very methodically one of the things i said was because they were trying to suggest this was a big russian joke and mm -hmm. i said look now, the Communist Party was still in full high gear at that point. This is before the Iron Curtain fell. And I said, look, Cass, their Communist Party news agency, these guys are not known for having a sense of humor, okay? And they're not about to ever put something out there that would cause the Soviets to look like a bunch of asshats. They're not going to do it. So. Whatever it was that caused them to announce this incident, this purported landing, they were dead serious about it. Well, then we're maybe two minutes before the end of the broadcast. And I said, well, Pat, look, in his last public appearance at West Point, General of the Army's Douglas MacArthur, addressed the 1962 class of graduating cadets who are now going into the active duty army. And in that speech, he advised them that at some point, and I'm paraphrasing, but you may be confronted with the evil forces from another solar system. And Buchanan went apoplectic. He said, where? Where did you see that? I've got his speech on my wall at home. Well, I had brought it with me, okay? I had a copy from West Point, all right? We had requested the speech, and I had a copy of it. And I said, well, Pat, I've got it right here. Oh, well, we're out of time. Well, the show ended. He said, We'll have to do this again. Of course, they always say that. They never right. mean it, but they right. say it. So the very next issue of the MUFON Journal, the editor, a guy by the name of Dennis Stacy, castigated me for making that announcement about MacArthur. He said, I could see UFO research going down the drain. And then Stacy got snowed under by all the people out there in the MUFON field that knew exactly what it was I was talking about and started sending him MacArthur's speech. Did I ever get a mea culpa or a sorry about that? Never. Nope. But that's the UFO field, okay? That's the UFO field. Okay. Back to Long Island. You're investigating these bodies what's the confluence that you notice between these mutilations cattle mutilations shipping cattle into the state and these allegations between brookhaven national lab and sh potentially shooting something down well i gotta tell you it's all theoretical it's all speculation on my part now i can sit here and i can speculate all day long all right are we going to know, ultimately, if I'm correct or not? No. No, we're not. 
I could speculate on why I think those bodies disappeared. Mm -hmm. Obviously, someone or something did not want those bodies examined. Okay? That's cut and dried. Just like with the overall human mutilation thing. Look, Sean, if that became public knowledge, and thankfully, this does seem to be a rare event. Not an event that happens all the time, but nevertheless, it in fact does happen occasionally. People would freak out if they saw that news and they believed it. Mm -hmm. To use a current example, okay, right now, okay, within the last couple of weeks, over in Europe, okay, with the current conflict going on between the Russians and the Ukrainians, Putin has pulled out, once again, his nuclear saber, okay, threatening the possibility of deploying that. Now, you're too young, but I was a young junior high school kid during the 62 missile crisis with Cuba. Okay? As a matter of fact, I was just telling some people about that last night. And my dad at that time was in the Army, okay? They were getting ready to ship him down to Florida. Guess why? Because at that Cuba. time. Exactly. Exactly. Right. All right. Now, thank God that got settled without very much bloodshed. There was some bloodshed. Okay. A lot of people forget that. The Cubans or the Russians, one of them, basically shot down a U-2 over Cuba. Were you aware of that? No. Yes. They shot one down. The pilot died. All right. The pilot was killed. So it wasn't completely bloodless, but that was nothing if something would have happened. Well, you know, the same thing today. All right. There is a lot of blood happening over there, but if someone were to go the route of nuclear weapons, this would spiral out of control so quickly. It would be amazing if we even saw it happen, okay? It could be that bad so fast. So, yeah, it's a dicey thing. But my point was, how many people have you heard on the media or anywhere else discussing this. One would think this would merit some news coverage, wouldn't you? Yes. Have 100%. you heard any? No. No, you have only Only if things are going well. The only reason you know things aren't going well is you don't hear anything. Yes, yes, yes. You can tell a hell of a lot by what you can't tell, what you don't see. Yes, yes. And that's true in practically every aspect of our life today. So in terms of Brookhaven National Lab and these kind of downed UFOs, how is it tied to Ford? Like, what's your take on Ford? What was well, his role in the world? You, you suggested, and, you know, after you said it sounds like he might have been bipolar, I thought about that, and actually... Years ago, when this was actually ongoing at the time, I had somebody else mention, I just remembered that not long ago, that he may have been bipolar. I got to tell you, because I couldn't go back there, I couldn't interface with this guy directly. And there were other people at the time I talked to, all right? about various aspects of this, the purported cattle being brought in, the missing children, because there were a lot of missing kids purportedly out of there, you know, the missing bodies, 
the purported downing of one of these craft. When was this purported down? Did they narrow it down to a specific year or was it just I, in the 90s? Until you mentioned it to me yesterday, it had been, I got to tell you, pal, it's been decades, all right, since I even thought about this. But I, for some reason, maybe 93, somewhere in there, maybe 93, 92, about that time period. I may be off by a year no, that, or so. That tracks, that tracks with the firsthand witness who I interviewed last week on the Transmedium episode. Okay. Where his experience was around kind of 92-ish, where there's a craft that just was hovering stationary over his home, but he lived in Long Island. Uh, yeah, I can't remember if it was Long Island or if it was in one of the New York's boroughs. Right. But it was the same time period. And he knew somebody who worked at the lab who told him about these rumors. And again, rumors, let's call them what they were, that either a craft crashed or they were downed. And I think his experience was there were craft that came in several days later or the day after, sometime around the same time period that were running grid patterns, i.e. it was a kind of like a search and rescue sort of aspect or feel to it. So, yeah, and again, and there's something weird about the downing of TWA Flight 800. Morehouse reported that they were working on some sort of high-powered microwave weapon it seems like there's four narratives now right the first narrative is the plane caught on fire it had issues and then crashed then there was the tomahawk cruise missile thesis that this thing was taken down by tomahawk cruise missile then there was morehouse's investigation which was yes there was a tomahawk cruise missile in the sky but they were working on this high-powered microwave to test the rad hardened missile to see how it reacted, which is why there was a SEAL recovery team in the area to recover the Tomahawk cruise missile. Now there's a fourth narrative, which is maybe they weren't shooting at a Tomahawk cruise missile after all. Maybe they were shooting at something else. And maybe they were shooting at something else with both the high-powered microwave and the Tomahawk cruise missile. So anyway, these are all theories. Tomahawk missiles, when you're talking about missiles, are not fast. Right. Okay. These are not hypersonic. They're not like an F-18 firing an air-to-air -air missile. They're not going to go thousands. Of, they may go, what, five, six hundred miles an hour, something like that. If you're going to be shooting at something in the sky, I don't know about you, but it doesn't track with me that you would use a tomahawk to try right. to knock something down. Right. You'd use tomahawk for land-based targets. Right. Right. So, so, for whatever that's worth. Yeah. So, again, that would fit the rad-hardened thesis, right? You're just trying to test the radiation-hardened Tomahawk cruise missile. Or it could just be that they were working on this high-powered microwave, and they may have shot down a craft using that in a separate instance. Because the TWA Flight 800 happened... I believe it was in 96. So it was four years after when this alleged downed craft was. Where did you hear about that? Was that all coming from Ford or was it coming from other people in the area? Initially, it came from Ford. Initially. And he had sent me at UFO Magazine some 35 millimeter slides of basically mm. debris. Okay. Look, I was never a photo interpreter, okay? That was not part of my job ever. But I looked at it, and honestly, from this standpoint today, Sean, all I remember looking at was what appeared to be junk. Mm -hmm. Nothing that was identifiable as anything, okay? Scraps and pieces of metal, that type of thing. Hell, you could have gone to an auto body workshop or a junkyard and taken photos like that. So to me, in the scheme of things, it meant nothing. And then I believe it was reported in the Washington Post, this whole incident, but it was skewed in a way that 
would make the modern legacy media envious, right? Like there was a clear narrative, whether or not it's true, but it was a clear narrative to make it look like Ford was a whack job. So then the Washington Post is basically the CIA's newspaper, it always has and always will be. But do you think that's what happened or is this not enough evidence? Definitely, I would not hazard a guess. But quite frankly, I just don't have enough data to support mm -hmm. going either way. All right. I just don't have the data. And today, I got to tell you, the Don Ecker of today would have to see a hell of a lot more before I would go there than the possibly even the Don Ecker of 1994 or five. All right. I've become increasingly skeptical. Look, I've been looking at this field for a long time, and this field is nothing if not an ocean of chaos. Some okay. real, some misinformation, some disinformation. And as you mentioned earlier in this interview, a veritable training ground for intelligence operatives. For the spokes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, final words on this, Don? Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's an easy question. The, the, easy, the, easiest, <laughs> the easiest answer is, hey, keep looking up. They might just, in fact, be up there. Look up. All right, my friend. It was an absolute pleasure. And I have many more questions after this. It's dark. It's dark stuff, but you don't hear this stuff because people don't talk about it. So this stuff has to be talked about. So thank you again. You're welcome. We're out of time. Thanks very much. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Don Ecker Live from Washington. We have a little fun there. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. Third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me a Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.